Hello, beautiful souls. How are you today? It is January 18th, 2024. And we have been going through a lot of huge missions and big energies. And so my spirit team only allows me to uh, use my energy to record and do readings sometimes because I'm doing missions all the time. And if you've been on this journey for a while, you understand it takes a good bit of energy, um, source light energy and uh, recuperation. So I'm very happy to be back with you again today. This is our second episode of Founding Father series. And today our subject is Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. I will be referring to notes and then I will go into um, intuitive channeling as well. Teddy Roosevelt was born in 1858 and died in 1919. He was the 26th president of the United States from 1901 to 1909. These are some of the facts we know about Teddy from the public records. He was a master Mason. He was registered Republican. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906. He was a Colonel in the US Army. Some of his um, accomplishments in his lifetime, he was an accomplished author, conservationist, explorer, historian, naturalist, police commissioner in New York, politician, soldier, and sportsman. His alma mater is Harvard University and Columbia University. He was president of the New York City Board of Police Commissioners and I believe he had a role in establishing the first police academy there. Um, fifth assistant secretary of the Navy and 33rd governor of New York State. Now, Nicole speaking. As you listen to these affiliations, they're full of um, position, prestige, power, and protection. Lots of favors. I venture to say, or garnered and given with those titles. As a child, Teddy outgrew childhood asthma with air quote, strenuous lifestyle and personification of a cowboy lifestyle. Now, my intuitive information on what he actually battled as a child will come into play later. And it's very, very interesting and not at all really what they portrayed. His first wife and mother died allegedly of unaffiliated reasons on the same night, causing a psychological break, which he recovered from by fleeing the state of New York to the Dakotas where he operated a cattle ranch. This is where he formed and led the Rough Riders. Now, the Rough Riders had missions all on their own. Um, and I'll get into that later. This set him up for governorship of New York in 1898, running on platforms of victory, peace, and prosperity. He proposed a square deal domestic policy to earn the citizens trust. This led to legislation known as the Antiquities Act of June 8th, 1906. This enabled Teddy and all succeeding presidents the ability to claim, also known as seize, historic landmarks, historic prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or scientific interest in federal ownership as national monuments. Five national parks were dedicated with this legislation. In the very beginning, of course, there's been many more. These were the first five. Crater Lake, Oregon, Wind Cave, South Dakota, Sully's Hill, North Dakota, Mas Mesa Verde in Colorado, and Platt, Oklahoma. All of these that I just named are negative off-world bases. Later, Teddy claimed the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, Petrified Forest in Arizona, 
El Moro, New Mexico, the Grand Canyon in Arizona and throughout other parts, and Montezuma's Castle in Arizona. Now, all of these places were either negative off-world or bases or areas of significant historical truth with evidence of extraterrestrials and uh, older civilizations occupying those lands that they wanted hidden. Mount Rushmore is one of the areas that was claimed under this Antiquities Act, and they decided to claim that land from the Lakota tribe as soon as gold was found, and then they seized the assets. Does this sound familiar at all? So when we think about the Grand Canyon, there's been lots of documented cases that cannot be explained. It cannot be explained away because there are hieroglyphs, there are um, ma old maps that dictate and show, illustrate that there's a lot more going on in the Grand Canyon than what we've been told. And so it came as no surprise that that was one of the areas that Teddy wanted to claim, fence off and make illegal for us to find the truth easily. Now, Yeshua came in several times in our conversations. We have discussed that the Grand Canyon area, what is known to us as the Grand Canyon, in his life and time was true Mesopotamia. And there were Egyptian villages all over what is known as the Grand Canyon. And it's in those places that are roped off, fenced off. They have to this very day, no fly zones where pilots, helicopter pilots cannot fly so that the evidence cannot be seen. It's also not easily accessible because that area known as the Grand Canyon was actually the Bay of California. It was full of water. And there's plenty of evidence to demonstrate that. And so the actual entrances to most of these paved villages and, and cliffside villages are at an elevation that equaled the water elevation. And so you have to now, today, the way it is now, um, be very, very sly, get beyond the fencing and the prohibited areas with all your gear to either scale, rappel down, and I'm talking thousands of feet, or climb up. And it's really been proven to be fatal for some who have tried this um, endeavor. But in 1909, there's been a documented case, G.E. Kincaid exploring the Grand Canyon. He was exploring by uh, boat in many areas there were still water uh, in some of the areas at this time, he crossed the evidence of the Egyptian civilizations in the Grand Canyon. He made his way out after several weeks documenting, making notes, and he provided a, um, a interview with a local newspaper about what he found. The cave access, he said, was 1,455 feet down a sheer canyon wall located on government land that prevents visiting under penalty of trespassing. Now, G.E. Kincaid, in his truest, earnest authenticity, sent some of the artifacts to the Smithsonian asking for an archaeological investigation. From the Smithsonian, they sent out a representative to Arizona to meet up with him. They gave him the go-ahead to um, create a dig party and so that he had workers that were willing to go out into this very remote, very difficult to get to area to claim, document, catalog all the evidence to the best of their ability. Now, the night before they were set to leave, Mr. Kincaid went missing. He never showed up for the morning departure. The entire dig was canceled. He was never found, and all the artifacts since the Smithsonian were destroyed. 
It was Teddy that pushed legislation through Congress, which made Congress the authority that has to approve all legal action against the Smithsonian, ultimately protecting the Smithsonian from any consequences of destroying evidence of historical truth that truly authentic uh, people in their endeavor to find and catalog the truth send to them. Now, another of our over the veil family members, uh, Grandpa K, he has let me know because he was on the planet during this time that Teddy made sure the capsized ships and wreckages that were at the bottom of the Grand Canyon because it was a bay were all destroyed and looted. It was his mission to take all the gold, all the gems, anything of value and hoard it away in gold stores for the elite and then destroy any other evidence that could lead to someone else going in search of these artifacts and treasures. It's really very resemblance to the movie's National Treasure, where the water, once the water is allowed back in, the truth is revealed kind of a deal. So we believe that when the old earth splits in the new earth, which has recently happened, and that is fully completed, then the area known as the Grand Canyon has water returned to it. And when that water returns, the truth will be revealed. And so um, right now, that area is still under massive amounts of weather manipulation that artificially keeps that area very dry, very harsh and desolate. That will change. So why were the Rough Riders fighting in Cuba? I saw that and I thought, well, gosh, what was going on in Cuba at that time? It was long before any uh, publicized crisis that I was aware of or could really find in a uh, mainstream. Well, I immediately thought that that was a cover for another raiding of a country's um, gems, minerals, anything of value, because this has been the, the play part of the playbook of the elites since their beginning. They want to take, 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 and then make you feel like you should be thankful for the crumbs that they give you. So they were, in fact, rough riders because they ran rough shot over smaller countries and weaker countries. Cuba being one, they seized many of the land and mineral rights, which gave them access to the oil and gems in that area and set up that country for communist takeover. Now, a lot of people think about... Um, Teddy Roosevelt, and they believe all the, the lore, and that he had this great relationship and respect for indigenous people. And that is also not true. So when he was seizing land, a lot of the land that he seized and that he just ran rough shot over was tribal land. And I guess in his way, he would ask nicely and then take it if they declined his offer. So one of the offers that was made a very long time ago was he wanted tribal land that belonged to the tribe that Sacagawea was a member of. And her leaders decided to trade her to keep their land. And that is how she became part of Teddy's entourage. She was um, indentured to him and he um, used her for any and all of his devious acts. Now, eventually, whenever he passed legislation, he went back and took that land anyway. So they, the, the tribal leaders, traded off one of their most intuitive and spiritual beings in Sacagawea 
in the hopes that the the greater good of their tribe would be able to maintain their tribal lands, cultures, and ways. And then a few years later, Teddy took the land, put them on a reservation, and kept Sacagawea anyway. So she was not in love with him, like was portrayed. They did not have a romantic, um, in the true sense of the word, relationship. She was in fact a sex slave for Teddy, among other things. And because of her abilities and because of her um, indigenous cultural ways, knowledge and skills, he exploited her ability to track and track her own people many times. Um, so when I mentioned that um, he was a weak child, he was in a weakened state. In lots of the uh, documentary um, type films and, and exposés that have been done on Teddy, they talk about him being a sickly child and that he could not uh, play and keep up with the other children and that he was determined to man up basically like cowboy up and that he just um, pushed his way through because his his mind was brilliant but he had to build his body and he was very visually impaired the the that's a true statement his vision was not very good well he was one of those soulless childs that was born a hybrid he was actually a hybrid between a werewolf and a vampire, which are supposed to be enemies. And so the dark side thought this would be a great experiment to create one and the same. Let's have both evils in one body. Well, in doing this, they created a monster. And there's many, many documented cases of um newborn vampires that are enraged they don't have guidance they don't have um the grooming for lack of a better word to show them the way of that type of darkness and because of the hybrid scenario that teddy was in a lot of what worked before did not work for him so in the documented evidence of him like suddenly becoming really muscular and um, being this naturalist and this amazing hunter. Yes, he was an amazing hunter, but he hunted to feed and he hunted his own kind and he, he hunted anything. And so he was quite possibly one of the most voracious hybrid killers created by the dark side, the dark side. So it's my belief and my intuition has really led me here. It popped into my head the first time I saw this fact. When his first wife and mother died on the same night, I believe that they were very aware of who and what he was and that they were no longer being able to be controlled, that uh, they were fearful and they were looking for help. And he um, made sure that neither one of them were going to make it through that night, if you know what I mean. Now, I feel like it was an enraged act that was not um, pre-planned or premeditated. And that, again, in the historical records, it says that his way of dealing with their death, this massive emotional loss, was to leave the area and start this, this ranching cowboy life in the Dakotas. And I do believe that he fled. I believe he fled because he heard their plea to, to not be this prolific killer in, in New York. And that um, there's documented cases that he would go out at night and um, the spin is that he would wear disguises so that he could see that his officers on the street as New York police commissioner were doing the right thing. But I believe he was shape-shifting and feeding. And because um, he had those abilities that there was a long string of unaccounted for homicides, murders in that area. 
and that it completely terrified the the people in his life that knew the truth and he got rid of them and then he fled he left the area went to the dakotas out to the wild west and he took on this personification of a naturalist a historian and um this this person that really loved nature but it was because he had to feed and he did and then his power grew and just like with any elite powerful figure you either comply or you die that's pretty much the option the options that a being is given there's not a whole lot of time for compromise or conversation and so he created the Rough Riders and in doing so turned them all into savage killers of his blood type, if you know what I mean. So then they set out to really run roughshod over these weaker countries. And they did so in tribal lands. They did so in all of these very... Um, spiritual communities, very highly intuitive communities, um, very culturally significant communities. And I had to ask myself, why was that? Like, why did they really truly go on this expedition to Cuba? Because at that time, it wasn't all that easy to get from land through water to land. Again, I mean, it was quite a task, the way that we understand it anyway. So I feel like, um, he was sent there on a mission and they went because for generations we we have seen evidence that these ruthless um, bloodthirsty killers they want a certain type of um, victim they prefer those that are dark complected those that are spiritual spiritually elevated those that have higher consciousness they want to take what they have by way of force and feeding and so i believe again totally my opinion that they chose the areas that they ran rough shot over for lack of a better term because they were hunting these specific characteristics that these, these different tribes and colonies and countries had. So those that were not fed upon were enslaved and some were turned into um, killers themselves. Um, and any any deviation from that obviously meant certain death. Our history has always been a battle of light and dark, always. There's always been an imbalance because the light plays by rules. We actually honor the universal laws. We honor the divine. And we understood and understand today karma and dharma. Now, there are light beings that are literally chosen to incarnate so that they can help raise the vibration and some semblance of balance of the light and the dark. So the first phase of winning this war was always to insert lightness so that it could not be totally dark. And then learn as best we could without becoming victim so that we could use our own playbook against them and overthrow the darkness. Now, on a very, very large scale, over thousands and thousands of years, this has transpired. In this now moment, the light has won. I ask you to tap into your higher collective consciousness, which is evident in in the collective these days, and I'm very happy to see it, and ask yourself, does this actually make more sense than the BS that we've been told? In many ways, as I have discovered truth, truth comes from within, truth comes from 
um, very wise ascendant masters that have lived many, many, many thousands of lives and have ascended to the level of mastery of their spiritual gifts and abilities that they remain neutral, but they are honest. Now, knowing that, feeling that this makes so much more sense than anything that we were ever told, that's your first clue that you're on the right track. When you start to hear things and you go, this resonance in your being, holy shit, our founding fathers were some of them vampires. And some of the wars that we thought were waged upon people that wanted to take our land was really the opposite. And they were feeding. They were on a feeding frenzy. Understand that higher consciousness beings, spiritual beings that did not fall in line with the doctrination and the dogma of the day have been hunted for a very, very long time. And so we have indeed turned the tables on those that have hunted us and we have used their own playbook against them and they are defeated. So please tap into that truth that lives within you. If you are a souled being, and that means S-O-U-L-E-D, you have a soul. You have the ability to connect with source creator and you don't need anyone's help to do it. It can be made easier by clearing your energy field. It can be made easier in many, many ways. But the main thing you want to do is turn off the noise because they have flooded us with lies and narratives that divide us instead of uniting us. And that is not source creator's plan for humanity to succeed. We do not su succeed in division. We succeed in unity. Now, there were plenty of founding fathers that were fighting for the light. They had to, they had to be there to offset the balance of the darkness. But old Teddy, he was bad. He was bad to the core of that being that had no soul, but was absolutely a hunter of people and all living things. Thank you for joining me today for episode two of our Founding Father series. Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, and I'll see you again next time.